Tombs are unquestionably one of the most fascinating discoveries which can be made within archaeology. The burial location of lost kings and emperors, due to the legacy and prestige of the individual, locating the burial site of remains is incredibly historically important. With certainly the most famous tomb discovery, rumored partial raid, and curse said by some to have been cast upon those who committed such acts was that of King Tut, more commonly known as Tutankhamun. Made by Howard Carter in the Valley of Kings on November the 4th, 1922, he located the unlooted tomb containing arguably the most famous historical figure and his accompanying artifacts ever found on Earth, the king's remains and his glorious solid gold jewel-encrusted death mask. Rumors have also circled other tombs for centuries, and if true, testament to the competence of the preservers of their kings and queens, many have claimed that when opened, for a few short astonishing moments, the individual seemed to have only just died, or in some cases appeared so well preserved as to still be alive also claimed to have decayed in the air before the discoverer's eyes. This reported worldwide from England to Antarctica, yet physical documentation of such phenomenon remains lacking. Yet, I digress. The following item of interest, if publicly exposed, could possibly be just as historically important. Recently discovered within Inner Mongolia, a sparsely populated yet enormous span of terrain, this find, quietly studied, and interestingly, although clearly of an incredibly curious form, was photographed very little. A typical symptom we often encounter when a find is made which includes civilian assistance. Yet these civilians, once the controversy that a find may create is recognized by the powers that be, are soon notified their services are no longer needed and details of its discovery confidential. Such as the media backout incurred within Cheops when Ganton Brink's robot successfully tunneled into a secret inner chamber, once rumored to have been connected to, or the tomb of the Egyptian god Osiris. Yet when the media and independent journalists were allowed to return to the site, Zahi Hawass and his team claimed the quote, tomb, had been looted in antiquity, leaving nothing but an empty room, one that curiously took them two weeks to examine, before eventually allowing the public to see it. This find in many ways is no different, in terms of the apparent media blackout which has descended upon the tomb's occupant, is incredibly familiar. The contents of the tomb and the actual sarcophagus-esque tomb itself it must be noted, are now proudly on public display. But the individual who was found within, which now appears to many to have possibly been the remains of an ancient alien, have been kept under close guard, as any efforts to attain any additional study or photography of the corpse have been in vain, and no others are yet to surface. Could this, in fact, be the remains of an actual ancient alien? Possibly a visitor who died on our planet, or a survivor of a crashed ancient alien craft, worshipped by an ancient civilization as a god. We find such possibilities incredibly intriguing. Jericho, also known as Tel Es Sultan, is a city with an incredibly rich history. It is located near the Jordan River on the West Bank, some 55 kilometers from Jerusalem officially catalogued as one of the oldest inhabited cities on the planet. More than 20 successive settlements have been unearthed within Jericho, the oldest of which so far discovered dates to around 10,000 BC over 12,000 years ago. In Jericho, strange and mysterious death practices were performed, these practices stemming from an as yet unknown origin. As well as placing the deceased under the floors of their homes, the people of Jericho also engaged in other unique mortuary practices. In some of the most peculiar, skulls were removed from the bodies and covered with plaster, attempting to create lifelike faces, complete with eyes, in some cases made from shells, and painted to imitate the hair and other features. 
The flesh and jaw bones were removed from the skulls in order to model the plaster over the bone. It is understood that the apparent goal of this particular technique was to try and achieve a likeness of the deceased through the sculpting of the plaster. It is thus believed that the physical traits would therefore appear specific to the certain individual who originally owned the skull, suggesting that these decorated skulls were portraits of the deceased. Evidence has also suggested that the skulls were then displayed or stored with other plaster skulls. The subtle modeling used to create the lifelike flesh should be perceived as an impressive feat in itself, seeing as though we are meant to believe that these impressive and artistically driven death masks were made by a supposedly primitive people as far back as 10,000 years ago. More than 60 plaster skulls have been found at six sites around the area of the Levant. Usually dated to 7,000 to 6,000 BC, some, however, have been dated as far back as 8000 BC. One such skull was excavated in the 1930s by John Garstang, along with five other plastered skulls, which are currently in the Royal Ontario Museum. Similar skulls were discovered by Kathleen Kenyon in the 1950s. Other sites where plastered skulls were excavated include Ain Ghazal and Amman, Jordan, and Tel Ramad, Syria. Most of the plaster skulls are from adult males, but some belong to women and children. The traditional interpretation for the mortuary practice is that the skulls offered a means of preserving and worshipping ancestors. Some experts maintain that there is a religious aspect to the practice, reflecting a belief that life continues after death. However, it is possible that the skulls are not so much religious objects as rather powerful objects of remembrance to commemorate loved ones. Another, more interesting theory is that the skulls were used as substitutes for the deceased to help ward off the return of the dead. Like some form of zombie repellent, regardless of their original purpose, they are certainly interesting in their own right. We often cover the extraordinary yet unexplained ruins that can be found all over our planet. However, as many of these ancient sites indicate, our ancient lost ancestors clearly had substantial advanced understandings we are yet to unravel. We feel, it is clear, that they were indeed technologically superior to us, the modern man. Thus, the question we must ask, just as we are, was this clearly advanced civilization capable of space travel? If so, then why did they not survive the mass exodus, which many feel befell the rest of these lost civilizations? Many people throughout history have been extremely interested in the concept of inhabiting other planets. In many ways, the habitation of other space bodies is a sound strategical contingency for species survival. For in a world at the mercy of other space bodies hurtling through the cosmos, not putting all of one's eggs in one basket will always be a great survival technique, giving the species twice the chance of survival. Mars, our nearest neighbor, has been the subject of countless theories involving past civilization, ancient or human, and the focus of NASA's most expensive space exploration missions, spending vast sums in the pursuit of several successful touchdown, and indeed, as mentioned, for a good reason. And just like the many ancient, advanced, unexplained features upon our planet, any past inhabitation, no matter how primitive, would not only be ignored, but logically, much more easily suppressed than the finds we share, which can be explored by us here on Earth. For exactly the same motives as ruins on Earth are ignored, any ancient civilization that could be found upon Mars would meet the same fate. For the proof of ancient civilization, predating that which academia has condemned themselves to dating and explaining as our more primitive modern ancestors' work, has to be suppressed. Academia must protect public confidence for the protection of current, profitable theory. Was Mars once inhabited? Was it inhabited by us? Perhaps the most worrying question surrounding all of this with academia so hell-bent on appearing correct, will we, as a species, ever find out? <laughs>